so I've been trying to figure out. I mean, I, I really don't know how to. I'm I'm stunned at the the popularity of the biblical lectures. I can't wrap my head around it. You know, no matter how hard I try, um, and I can't I can't even judge their significance. You know, so small or great, but they've attracted a lot of views. So we'll stick with that. So then. Assuming that they have some significance, I've tried to figure out, well, what was it that made them work? Why, why did people come and listen to what I was saying about, the, the, about Genesis? And I think partly it was because I wasn't exactly telling people what I thought about them. I wasn't saying, this is how you should read these stories. I was trying to investigate something I knew was beyond my comprehension. And I was doing that on my feet. Now... I talked to someone this week who is quite explicitly religious and I could hardly listen to him because he kept telling me what was right. <laughs> he kept telling me the dogma. It's like, well, for, are you so sure you know that? And like, who the hell are you to tell me that? And that, and it just, there was just no meaning being revealed from that. There was no investigation. Like I approached the Bible as a psychologist in some sense, but as if it was something I really didn't understand, a strange artifact. Uh, God only knows what it is. It's this book that's been around forever cobbled itself together in a manner we can't understand. It's lasted for a very, very long period of time. It's had an inestimable impact. It's full of extraordinarily strange stories that, that we understand very little about in some profound sense. And it was an investigation, and I kind of pulled people along with me during the investigation, and that that seemed to... And, and maybe when I when I go to church, do I see... Do I see that? Do I feel that I'm being led along an investigation into the structure of deep meaning? And the answer is not usually. I, I usually feel as if I'm being told what to think or told what to believe. And that's just, that doesn't seem to work. It's But the church fathers preach in exactly the way you're describing. And we, we luckily have some of these sermons, like of Augustine, that he gave, we'd say, off the cuff. There was a secretary out in the crowd who would take them down. He would probably polish them later. But you get a sense of someone who's doing what you're saying, I think, thinking through with the text as he goes. Um, he was theologizing, philosophizing, but he was, he was trying to draw his people. He was a pastor, Augustine. He wasn't an academic. He wasn't a professor of theology at a university. He was a pastor trying to draw his people closer to God. And he learned the method, by the way, from Ambrose. When he goes to Ambrose in Milan, he's a, he's a um, manichae. He's not even a Christian. But he heard that Ambrose was a great rhetorician, so he went to hear his rhetoric. And while he was there, he learned the method of reading the Bible, which is this more allegorical, spiritual method. That's what Jung appreciated. That's what you're doing in many ways. The young Augustine learned it from Ambrose. And then he bequeathed that to us in his sermons and biblical commentaries. But trust me when I tell you, we didn't study that. We didn't study that approach. Ours was a very scientific rationalistic approach to the Bible. And that's why preaching is relatively bad, I would say. So you've, in a way, stumbled on something that's very old, you know, mm. but still has enormous power to transform people. There's also something important, well, Jordan, in understanding that at least the, the traditional churches, at least the liturgical churches, that you don't, you don't, them, like for example, in the Orthodox Church, they always say, if the sermon is more than 15 minutes, it's pride. It's like keep your sermons as short as possible because you're not there to encounter. Yeah, I'm pro obviously, obviously guilty of that. You, you're not. You're not there. I mean, it's propositional understanding is fine, but it's participatory. Right? Church is participatory. So you enter into the church. It's a like you imagine an Orthodox church, even a, a traditional Catholic church. You have a space which is structured as the hierarchy, ontological hierarchy of being, and then you see these images which are patterned and are revealing to you these mysteries that are beyond words and then you participate in this singing these processions and it's it is it is a participative thing and so if mm -hmm. you go there to kind of get knowledge it's not the same type of, of of practice and as you're singing these songs and as you're hearing these hymns all of a sudden two images connect together and all of a sudden you know these things start to connect inside you in somewhat in almost a kind of super rational way and the insights you get, sometimes your heart, you have difficulty explaining them, but they're very deep and they're, they're embodied as you bow down, as you kneel, as you 
eat the body and 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 blood of Christ. These are these are different types of, of participation than just. And Jonathan, yeah. I, I'm totally in agreement with you. And what did we do in our Catholic churches in the West? <laughs> The same time we were presenting the Bible in this in this flattened out historical critical way, we also were flattening out our churches, emptying out our churches of just that mystical cosmic symbolism, the angels, the saints, color, uh, the the cosmic dimension, and we flattened them out and we made them like you know uh, empty meeting spaces. So there there was a terrible rationalism that descended upon the church and it dried us up in many ways. Um, you know, so I, this is, again, my mea culpa as a Catholic. I think we passed through a period that was really problematic. And and recovering the sources, the, you know, ressourcement, we say, right? Recovering the, the great sources of the Bible and the fathers. That's what, that's what we're talking about. The, what the Bible had by its nature, what the fathers understood, that's what we need to revive the church, I think. So, look, but Bishop, you're doing something right, obviously. You're attracting some online attention, some substantial online attention. And Jonathan, the same is true of you. And well, John, it goes without saying for you to some degree, because you're a professor and you have that whole, you know, that whole world at your fingertips in some sense. And you've been very successful at that. But in the more specifically religious domain, the more specifically Christian domain, you two are having some some public success. What are you doing right, do you think? <laughs> I'll let Jonathan go first. Like well, I, actually, I think, you know, I think Bishop Barron and I are are doing very similar things, which is why I've mm-hmm. always felt mm-hmm. akin to what he's doing. I've written for his for one of his publications. I always felt we're close in the approach, which is, first of all, a avoiding just argumentation, but, at, but rather this kind of presentation of beauty. Uh, you know, Bishop Barron also, even in his publications, this desire to kind of have a beauty first approach, this kind of encounter with these powerful patterns of being and you know how they kind of point to Christ. And I think that showing the deep coherence, the deep narrative coherence in, in scripture, and then pointing back out to the world and saying, this deep coherence in scripture, you're gonna encounter it in movies and in all these cultural phenomena that you're going to see, you're going to encounter the same deep patterns that you find in scripture at a lower level, we could say, but that all of these kind of culminate into, and so it really is like a meaning first approach and a beauty first approach, I think, which is which is, which is is attracting people because the insights they get at first, they can't, I have people who watch my videos for two years and tell me they don't understand what I'm saying. And I'm like, well, why are you watching my, how can you have been watching my videos for two years if you don't understand? And they seem to express that they get these insights and they can't totally explain them. And, and then it keeps them kind of wanting to, to continue on in, in on this path, let's say towards, ultimately a lot of them end up moving towards Christianity and entering a church at some point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my thing has been uh, beauty and truth. I mean, so don't dumb it down. Uh, I lived through dumbed down Catholicism. And it was a pastoral disaster. You look at all the surveys. I studied them very carefully, why young people are leaving. The scandals come up. The scandals will be mentioned, but by far the, the most prominent reason is I don't believe the doctrines. I never had my questions answered. Uh, it's in conflict with science. It doesn't make sense. They're intellectual problems. Well, yeah, I get it. We dumbed the project down for about 50 years. Uh, so smarten it up and and reintroduce people to this tradition we've been talking about. The second thing is the beautiful. We also, as we dumbed it down, we also <laughs> uglified it. You know, we we, we uh, uh, de-emphasized the beautiful. So, one example, you know, we put out this word on fire Bible. So the text of the of the Gospels, but it's a bit like an illuminated manuscript idea that we surrounded it with mm-hmm. glosses mm-hmm. from the fathers and the popes and the great theologians, but also lots of artwork, lots of color. So I want to pe- reintroduce people to the Bible, but not in a flat, rationalistic way, you know. So that's what I've been trying to do. I, yeah, well, I was certainly attracted to Jonathan to begin with because of the quality of his artistic yeah. endeavor, right? This absolute, these absolutely beautiful and archaic, yeah, well, traditional. Let's say not archaic, traditional. This traditional uh, uh, medium that he was revitalizing and in, in mm-hmm. such a stunningly beautiful way, and that's that, that was the entry point into getting to know him and getting to understand his thought and yeah and beauty isn't you, the thing you can't argue against today yeah. beauty just smacks you and 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 that's really something so and, and you can also help people notice that it's like well notice beauty book 
beauty brooks no argumentation. Right. What do you think that signifies? What's it pointing to? Yeah. Is it pointing to something higher? It certainly seems to. What might be higher? We need to figure that out. Well, it's the least threatening of the transcendentals in the postmodern context. So people today, you say, here's something that's true. Who are you going to tell me what's true? I got my own truth. Even worse, here's the way you ought to live. Here's the good. Who are you to tell me how to live? But the beautiful doesn't preach in that negative sense. It, it just is. You know, it shows itself. So it's more winsome. I, and it's, it's, a more, it's a less threatening way into the project. So that's why I've tried to lead with it. Especially in a world that's ugly, like our world is just so right. ugly. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. the mm-hmm. modern mm-hmm. the modern world is just so banal that, you know, if there's a reason why tourists go to cities and visit churches, even though they're not Christian and they don't care about it, because they go someplace and they're looking for a beautiful for beauty, and then they end up in a church rather than in a mall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely worth thinking about. You know, and the intent, incredible value that's to be found in those unbelievably be- beautiful constructions. It's like, what is that beauty? And why do we experience it there? Those, those lattice-like creations of stone and crystal with color and the addition of the music, that all goes to your liturgical point, the drama yeah. that's part of that. And, and, and the celebration of beauty, Shark which Cathedral. is definitely absent in the modern culture. Yes. Yeah. 